Just what were you thinking? I thought we pirates had an unspoken agreement. Don't cause us any trouble. And who ever heard of a pirate helping people anyway? If I see you in the new world, then I'm going to crush you. Hello and welcome to One Piece 101, the series that breaks down everyone and everything in the One Piece world. Today, we are going to be looking into quite possibly the most mysterious and intriguing member of the worst generation, Jewelry Bonnie. Jewelry Bonnie, also known as Big Eater, is the captain of the very creatively named Bonnie Pirates, who was first introduced to us during the events of Saba the Archipelago. She appears as a slim, fairly standard style of female design from Oda, despite the fact that as alluded to in her epithet, she is a prolific consumer of food and is almost certainly one of the most gluttonous characters to ever set foot in the world of One Piece, which is quite an achievement actually, considering the sheer amount of other crazy eaters out there. But in general, Bonnie also presents herself as quite a rude and curt individual who believes in a more stereotypical view of piracy, often acting simply to indulge her own personal interests and sparing little thought for the well-being of others, which was shown when Bonnie actively refused to help a man who had been shot by a world noble because he was a stranger who meant nothing to her. And in fact, Bonnie actively looks down on the idea of pirates helping people in general. Despite this, Bonnie is not without her own sense of empathy, which we'll certainly get to over the course of this video, but as for right now, it needs to be noted that what I said about Bonnie in the introduction was not just to hype her up. Now, she is a bit of an enigma in One Piece at the time of this recording, but that only makes her all the more intriguing to examine. As far as her official past is concerned, we begin with the arrival of the Bonnie Pirates at Sabadi Archipelago, which is more or less the halfway point of the Grand Line, along with the rest of the Rookie Pirate Captains, who were then referred to as the Supernovas, and who had each taken a separate path through the deadly stretch of water and were planning on entering the New World. In regards to the Bonnie Pirates themselves, they seemed completely dedicated to their captain, willing to fulfill her every need, most of which were uh, food related, although it is debatable over whether or not Bonnie values her crew to that extent in return. But of course, as they are our first port of call, it was off to a restaurant where Bonnie encountered fellow supernova Capone Gang Beige, who was quite possibly the exact opposite of Bonnie, preferring to follow the strict code of fine dining and appropriate table manners. In fact, Bonnie's gluttonous rampage disgusted Beige so much that he was on the verge of ordering his crew to quote unquote, shut her up, until it was pointed out to him that starting a quarrel so close to Navy headquarters may not be the best of ideas. But after indulging her gluttonous needs, Bonnie was then caught up in a horrendous situation with another supernova, Rora Noa Zoro, who was on the verge of attacking a world noble, an action that would have resulted in the summoning of a marine admiral and likely the capture of every prominent pirate on the island, including herself. So with a mind for self-preservation, Bonnie then salvaged the situation by invoking her powers, turning herself into the form of a young girl and pretending to cry over her older brother Zoro, who she claimed had been shot. And while we're here, this is a great time to highlight Bonnie's abilities, which have to do with age manipulation. And being one piece, it is assumed that these abilities are the result of an as of yet unnamed devil fruit. However, thus far the series and its extended materials have avoided all possible avenues of confirming this. For example, in her entry for the One Piece Vivia card data book, her powers are mentioned, but they are not specifically attributed to a devil fruit. Whereas with the other members of the worst generation, a devil fruit is specifically mentioned, even if that fruit has not currently been named. So that's one of the many Bonnie curiosities we encounter, and there's a lot more to come. But for now, she exhibits the ability to both age herself and others, and in both directions as well. So seemingly at her whim, she can revert someone to a child or advance them to the status of geriatric. Currently, there are no known restrictions for the use of the power or limitations of the aging itself. For example, could she age someone to the point where they die or even de-age someone to the point of non-existence? All of these questions and more exist. Although the most interesting idea that comes from this power is that as a result, you cannot take Bonnie's established form at face value because it's entirely possible that she could be significantly younger or older than she casually portrays herself as being. Whatever the case, Bonnie's actions in halting Zoro would not stop his captain, Monkey D. Luffy, from socking a world noble in the face, thus forcing Bonnie to face the possibility of encountering a Marine Admiral. However, using her abilities, Bonnie was able to successfully escape the onslaught of Marines brought to Sabadi, although she did either remain or return to the archipelago in order to watch the events of the Paramount War. And during this time, Bonnie demonstrated some, up until this point, uncharacteristic emotion, being moved to tears by the events of the Whitebeard Pirates facing off against the Marines. And given that Bonnie has no demonstrable love for the world government, it can be assumed that she does have a direct connection to either Whitebeard or a member of his crew, such as Ace. However, this is all pure speculation at the time of this recording. Later, the Bonnie Pirates set sail to the outskirts of Marineford to view the final stages of the war, along with many of the other supernovas. And after the war had concluded, Bonnie was furious, declaring that this was all the fault of a certain man and that they were setting sail for the new world to confront him immediately. 
And of course, it is heavily implied that that man is Blackbeard, given that he was legitimately responsible for sparking the Paramount War. And because the next time we see Bonnie, she and her crew had been completely defeated and at the mercy of the Blackbeard Pirates. Bonnie was then offered the chance to join the Blackbeard Pirates if she, quote, became his woman, to which she violently refused by kicking Blackbeard in the head, which despite that while her physical abilities may not be her primary attribute, she certainly has the power to hold her own in this world if need be. At this moment, Marine Admiral Akainu arrived on the island, forcing the Blackbeard Pirates to abandon Bonnie and her crew, and they were taken into the custody of the Marines. But not before Akainu said something incredibly intriguing to Bonnie, hinting at her past, and that was, a cold shiver ran through me when I heard you'd run away from the world government, but it's all over now. And to put this into some perspective, this is Sakazuki saying this, one of the most undisputed powerhouses of the entire series. For him to have a cold shiver running through him in relation to Bonnie would imply that she's connected to something pretty damn huge. This is despite the fact that the world government have only seen fit to bestow Bonnie with a bounty of 140 million berries. However, I imagine that cold shiver ran through Sakazuki once more because Bonnie did manage to escape from the Marines. However, her crew were not as lucky and it would appear that Bonnie was forced to invoke her classical philosophy of piracy and abandon them. From here, Bonnie would not be seen again until the events of the Dressrosa Saga, reading about the newly formed pirate alliances between her fellow supernovas, now referred to as the Worst Generation. She was then seen once again reacting to the news of Dolphamingo's defeat by the hands of Monkey D. Luffy and Trafalgar Law, going on to comment that she was quite proud to be considered one of their contemporaries. And it is at this point in the video that we need to do the old spoiler warning. This warning is for those of you who have not yet completed the Reverie arc in the anime or the manga. I can't stress this enough, these spoilers are not insignificant, so if you don't want to be bombarded with them, then please do skip to this this time in the video, however for everyone else, let us continue. During the events of the Reverie, Bonnie infiltrated the Holy Land of Marijoa by posing as the Queen of the Sorbet Kingdom by using her age manipulation abilities. Now, quite notably, the Sorbet Kingdom was once ruled by current Warlord of the Sea slash Cyborg Slave, Bartholomew Kuma. And also the name of the Queen of the Kingdom is Connie, strikingly similar to the name Bonnie. But you know, we're not here to speculate too much on that. Although Bonnie's entry in the Viviacard data book does expand on it a bit by stating that Bonnie does bear a resemblance to Queen Connie, implying that Connie is in fact a real person rather than some sort of made up alias. However, Bonnie would go on to encounter Kuma, who was being used as an invincible slave by the world nobles, and proceed to shed a tear and claim that they would pay for what they had done, indicating that she has some form of personal relationship with Kuma. Some more fun facts about Jewelry Bonnie. One of Bonnie's primary characteristics, apart from mass consumption, is holding grudges. Whether it be against Blackbeard for starting the Paramount War, the Straw Hat Pirates for inadvertently summoning a Marine Admiral to Sabadee, or the World Government for whatever they've done, which is probably quite a lot, it's very common for Bonnie to mark her rare appearances in the series by stating that someone will pay for something that they've done. Rather curiously, in Volume 68, Jewelry Bonnie's age and height are given, the former of which is stated to be 22 pre-time skip. This is despite the fact that I said earlier that her age is impossible to accurately determine at this stage due to her abilities. And whilst you could say that the words from Oda should be taken as immediate canon, the truth is that the SBS segments and data books have been known to lie to us before when it concerns future plot revelations. So as of right now, I wouldn't take this as the be all and end all of the matter. Following the introduction of Charlotte Lin Lin, it has become a popular thought amongst the One Piece fan base to speculate over whether or not Bonnie was related to the Emperor due to their similarities in regards to pink hair, lipstick, both being voracious om nom nommers, with powers that can affect the lifespans of their victims, as well as both having ships with a theme of sweets. Although it should be noted that Bonnie's fixation with food is not entirely sweets based, as her favorite food is margarita pizza, whilst her least favorite food are carrots. Jewelry Bonnie's namesake comes from the real life pirate Anne Bonnie, who began life as a noble woman before switching over to the realm of piracy and who is quite possibly the most famous female pirate of all time. As a fairly major character in the series, Bonnie has been subject to fan drawing requests from Oda, including what she looked like as a child, which appears to depict a poor yet similarly voracious little being, as well as what she would look like if she had her gender swapped, which to me just looks an, uh, an awful lot like Shanks with longer hair and a piercing. And finally, a truly useless fact, in the SBS of Volume 88, it was revealed that if One Piece was set in the real world, then Bonnie would be from Australia. And it is about damn time that we were given a character. So you know what? Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. And I'm, I'm just going to assume that the Australians in the comment section have now promptly said, oi, oi, oi. But that pretty much does it for Jewelry Bonnie. If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produced in general, then please do consider donating to the Grand Line Review Patreon because the support of all of you amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. And if you'd like to see more videos like this but apply to other anime and manga series, then please do check out my second channel, New World Review, for all of your wider needs. And if you'd like to join the fun at any time, then please do head over to my Discord server where a wide array of shenaniganry takes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with who, what, or where you'd like to see featured in the next One Piece 101.
And just in case you were curious about where some of the other Worst Generation members would be from if One Piece was set in the real world, well, Basil Hawkins would be from Egypt. Aruj would be from India, and Eustace Kidd would be from Scotland, which you can tell by his red hair, outwardly violent and bloodthirsty nature, as well as his general demeanor of being a miserable bastard. Just kidding, Scotland, I love you. One of the most beautiful countries I have ever visited. Look, see, here's the proof that I was, uh, that I was inside of you. Please don't forsake me.